Um, good morning. Uh, you know who I am, so I'm not going to do all the introductions. We're going to we're going to start. Are you, can you hear okay? Not, not really. Okay. Is it getting better? I think so, yeah. Okay. So, t today we're going to start with... Uh, I, I hope you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna be sick of me by the end of the morning because I'm going to do the two presentations. And you have to be nice to me because, you know, I can stay here and you have to skip lunch. So, you know, I can, I can be pretty nasty, so you better be nice to me. So anyways, okay, so to, we're going to do sample size and power this morning. Uh, well, both of them are in the morning, and then we're going to do descriptive statistics. Um, I have to be honest with you, this is more interesting than the descriptive statistics. So, but I hope you'll enjoy both. All right, so sample size and power, very important stuff. You know that, I don't have to explain, but I do have a slide that says why is it important? So why do, why do we care about uh, sample size and power? Why, why should we care? Okay, so power is the probability, and, and I forgot to start by saying, you know, our presentations have overlaps. You know, you, you, you'll hear the, the, the same concept from different people. And, and we thought that instead of worrying to make sure all the slides don't overlap at all, because, you know, we don't want to say the same thing, we thought, after all, why not? You know, if they overlap a little bit and we say it in slightly different ways, why not? It's okay. So, so many things that I'll talk to you about, not a lot, but some things I'll talk to you about, you've heard them yesterday, but again, that's okay. So power is the probability of getting a statistically significant result when in fact there is a clinically meaningful difference that we don't know, of course. So when there is actually a, the truth that we don't know, there is an effect, power is really the probability of detecting such an effect. So it's something good. We want to be able to have power so that if there is an effect, we find it. That's what power is. The thing is that a lack of a statistical significance does not prove that there is no treatment. So if we don't find a statistically significant result, it doesn't prove that there no, there's no treatment effect. It may be a consequence of a small sample size, okay, S or a low power. But then studies with low power are unlikely to produce statistically significant results even when a clinically meaningful effect does exist. Okay? So I'm, I'm going, you know, I'm a mathematician. I go, I'm trying to make a point. So therefore, if you put all these points together, it is important to have enough power and an adequate sample size. I, I, are you following the logic? Nod your head if yes, okay. So that's, that's really what it's all about. You don't want to conduct a clinical trial that doesn't have enough power because if you don't find something, you don't know the actual result. You don't know because if you don't find a statistically significant result, you don't know if it is because there is no effect or because you had low power. So it's important up front to say, I'm going to make everything I can so that if there is a treatment effect in true, that I will find it. Okay? So I just wanted to... Do you have a question? No. Uh, yeah, questions. Uh, I'm going to try to do the same thing. You know, I'm going to try to pause and, and, and answer questions. If you have a burning question, you know, you're stuck on a slide and you say, I, I can't move, I can't follow because I'm stuck, just raise your hand. It's okay. It's okay. And we'll adjust. If it gets too wild, well, I'll say no more questions. So I have a question for you. And statisticians are not allowed to answer. Without question mark, there is no need for statistics. The field of statistics is useless. Without what? 
It's a question. We need microphone or, or shout. Sample, without sample. Good answer, but not... Without? Uncertainty. Very good answer. But yeah, it, it, it's very close. Very close. I didn't hear. Hypothesis. Yes, that's true. Not variance. You get a chocolate. That's right. Without variability, there is no need for statistics. And I'm going to show you what I mean by that. Why? What's, what's the connection? So suppose you have I'm showing you uh, simple stuff. You have going this way, this way, it's good. Okay, so you have a new treatment and you have an old treatment and you have the two averages and this is where they fall. Okay, so I have a question for you. Is the new treatment better than the old treatment? I see a yes and I see a no. I see a no. Confidence? Oh, you don't know. Okay, let's, let's explore this, all right? So the question is, is the new treatment better than the old treatment? I'm looking at the means. All right, so what if now I'm going to show you the data? Is the new treatment better than the old treatment? Yes. Pretty clear. Okay. What about now? Is the new treatment better than the old treatment? I, I would say yes. I mean, you know, they, most all the points are, right? What about now? Yeah, it's getting a little bit, uh, maybe. So what changed? Variability. It's the same mean. Did you ever wonder why we call it analysis of variance when we compare two means? Why do we call it analysis of variance when we're comparing two means? Because really what we're analyzing is the variance. Because the means by themselves, just like we saw, they don't tell us how, how far apart they are. But if you give me the spread, then I can see you know, if they're all here, for the control and all here for the new treatment, then you say, oh yeah, but that's the variance that was analyzed, not the average, even though that's what's of interest. So first I'm going to give you like a, a, a very high level picture of what affects the sample size and the power. And this is just one slide. Then we're going to go in detail with every single point that affects sample size and power. And just like I said yesterday, this is not for you to, you know, it's just concepts. Think just concept. The point is to just give you the thinking. That's all. So we just found out that variability affects sample size. I mean, if it affects how clearly you can see a difference, it affects sample size, it affects power, because you need more to see, to be able to find out where they are apart. So, very, but again, this is high level and we're gonna go into the details, we're gonna show you the formula. So, what else uh, affects the sample size? The size of the clinically meaningful treatment effect worth detecting. Okay, and that's a clinical question, that's not a statistical question. So you ask the investigator, you ask the subject matter expert, which is you, the statistician asks the subject matter expert, what do you think would be a difference that is worth detecting? When do you start saying, oh, this is, this, if I knew this at the end of the trial, I would definitely switch practice. For example, I'm making it up. Okay, that's what this uh, clinically meaningful difference is all about. And basically, in simple language, I usually say in simple English, but that's not going to help you. In simple language, 
levels of assurances, and you have two levels of insurance, assurances. Not concluding a positive treatment effect when it is in fact too small. You want to make sure you don't make that mistake. Okay? You want to be sure about that as much as you can. And you don't want to be detecting a meaningful treatment effect. You, you want to detect a meaningful treatment effect when it does exist. You want to be sure that you do that. So these are the two assurances you really would be very, uh, are good properties of your test, of your statistics. And that's what sample size does. Now, yesterday we heard about, you know, confidence intervals versus the confidence, two confidence intervals versus the confidence interval of the difference. So this is about the, the difference between two treatment group. And for hypothesis testing, you basically are controlling for the set of values uh, of the probability of type 1 error and type 2 error. That's the alpha and the beta that we heard yesterday. Okay? So that's what you do in hypothesis testing. But for confidence intervals, you want to control. In other words, you want to set up front the, the, the confidence level and the precision. How tight, how how the, the width, what's the width of your confidence interval? So you say, yeah, I, I want a confidence, confidence interval that's this small, and that gives you the, the sample size. So in hypothesis testing, you say, I want it to make, you know, a chance of making a type 1 error to be this, a chance of making a type 2 error to be this, and therefore, what is my sample size? In, in confidence intervals, you say, I want an estimate and a confidence interval that is this tight, and therefore I need this kind of sample size. And the two are equivalent. Now don't confuse with what we were saying yesterday. We're talking about confidence interval of the difference. Okay? If you do that, then the two are equivalent. So this is another slide to kind of contrast the hypothesis testing and the confidence intervals. So in hypothesis testing, you have alpha significance level. In the confidence interval, you have a confidence level. So you say 95% confidence level. So in hypothesis testing, you say 5% significance level. In confidence intervals, you say 95% confidence level. The power in hypothesis testing is kind of equivalent to the width of the interval. So you say 90% power, and you have an estimate plus or minus the width divided by 2. So you have half the width, half the width, and obviously the 2 is the total width. OK, are we OK so far? Yeah? OK. So. This is the outline of the presentation. I mean, I'm going to go, like I said, over the, d the details about the assumptions uh, that are needed, the parameter values that are needed. Then there is a simulation, and I'm going to actually skip that second bullet, the simulation when formulas are not available. And I'm going to just say what it is and then just skip. You have the slides. You can go through the slides. I think you can understand what the slides say, but because of time, I don't want to rush through the slides. But what I think is important for you to see is the presentation of sample size and power. Because as investigators, you know, you're going to be talking to your statistician and, and I'm going to show you one thing that you don't want the statistician to tell you. In other words, don't, don't give it to me like this. I want to see it like this. And I'm going, to, I'm going to give you an example of both. So I think the, the presentation of sample size and power is, is kind of important to show you. You may know it, but just in case. And then sample size recalculation is also something that is pretty important. Uh, but if we have time, after the presentation of sample size and power, I'll continue on the sample size recalculation. If we don't have time, you can look at the slides. So now I'm going to go through really the, the heart of, of today's presentation, of this presentation, which, and we, it's going to take a big chunk of time, which is the assumptions. What, what is it that the statistician is, well, I can put the first, 
I'm going to skip this. What, what I'm going to talk about is what is it that the statistician is going to ask you. So you go to your statistician and you say, I've got a trial, I want to run, well, I might as well put the generic example. So objective, I want to investigate the effect of a new medication on diastolic blood pressure in hypertensive patients. So this is the investigator, you, coming to me and saying, this is what I want to do. Okay, good. And let's say that we've talked and we decided to do parallel groups, uh, the new medication versus placebo, and the measurements are collected at baseline and at week 12. Okay. And the primary endpoint is the change between baseline and week 12. Okay. So, and then you ask the statistician, what is an adequate sample size? Uh, there is a, a YouTube a video that is really funny, actually, and it's animation, it's not real people. Um, and, and you see this guy, I, I, I would have shown it, but uh, it, it, you see this guy talking to a statistician and say, you know, can you tell me if, if three is enough for my clinical trial? That's the first thing. Uh, and the statistician looks and says, what are you trying to do? Oh, I'm trying to do blah, 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 blah. Can you tell me if three is enough? Well, I need more information. Well, you know, my, my, my application is due tomorrow morning. I just want to know if three is enough. And, and it goes on and on, and you see the statistician. And at the end, the statistician tells the investigator, go away, please. <laughs> so so the, the thing is, you know, we don't have magic. You know, you, we can't say, you know, what's the right sample size? Oh, well, it's, you know, 105. We can't do that. So we need information. And, and, and really, my goal of t this presentation is for you to understand why the statistician needs that information. That's all. If, if, if that is accomplished, then I'm fine. Because that's, that's, that, to me, is a, is a big step. It's actually a big step. Just understand why we're asking. We're not trying to be difficult. Uh, we, we just, we need this. I mean, we, we can't do it if we don't know it. And, and we cannot decide for you because we don't know your field as well as you do. That's basically that simple. So, now, don't be intimidated by this formula. This formula is from the book. Uh, I don't know it by heart. I don't go and look at the formula and do it by paper. We don't do this anymore. But the reason I'm showing it is because we're going to go back to it again and again and again, not in terms of how to calculate or what exactly do they mean. I want to point to you what are the components of this formula. This is a kind of a, this, the simplest formula for sample size, actually. It, and that's why I, I wanted to talk to you about simulation, because things get very complicated very quickly. But again, concept, that's all I'm interested in, concept. So we're going to see this formula again and again only to show you where what is needed comes from. So this is a formula for a sample size per treatment group for continuous outcome. So N is for one treatment group. So if you have two treatment groups, you multiply by two. And all you have to know for now is that the, where the, you see the alpha and the beta, that's type one error, type two error. Sigma square is variance. We kind of know that. And the delta square in the denominator is the clinically meaningful difference to detect. Okay? More than that, you don't, Z is the, you know, percentile of the normal distribution, uh, fine. You don't, need, you don't need to worry about that. But that's basically what this formula is. So, we're gonna, we're gonna go, like I said, you're gonna see this formula and again and again. So, so we go back to the previous example and we say, okay, let's plug in things. 
So this is the example I just talked to you. It's, not this, it's the same example. That's objective design primary endpoint. Okay, and now we need some, well, we're gonna use the formula, right? So, so the statistician needs to know it's two-sided, yes. What's the significance level? 0 0.05, okay. Uh, what's the power? 90%. And this is a little bit of discussion. Some things are, the clinical investigator, the investigator says this is what it is, and some of the time it's, it's actually a discussion between the statistician and the investigator. And, and significance level and power is actually one of them. A difference to detect, again, remember what we were talking about. What is the difference? So three millimeter is, if I find a difference of three millimeters or more, this is worthwhile clinically. That's really the thinking behind it. So the thinking behind it, if it was two or one, nobody's gonna say, oh wow, this is great. But if it's three, physicians are gonna start, or nurses or, or clinicians are gonna start to say, well, you know, this is, this is worthwhile. And again, a statistician is not gonna be able to say that because they just don't know. Standard deviation of change, and we're gonna talk about that because it's very hard. I mean, this is the hardest thing. I mean, the statisticians say, well, what do you think the variance is? I don't know. It's very hard. Uh, so let's say, just to make the, you know, today's discussion that, you know, the standard deviation is 15 millimeters. So you plug in, you know, you get the Z of 0.975, the Z of 0.90. This is all from the formula. Uh, sigma squared is the standard deviation squared, it's the variance. Delta squared, the clinically meaningful, yeah. yeah I'll, I'll. And, and then you plug in these numbers and you get N is 526. Remember 526 is per group. You multiply by two, boom, 1052 is the sample size for your trial. Okay, so that's, that's fine. Uh, can we have a microphone please for Giselle? Well, I, I can't hear you well. Can we have microphones? No, that's okay, that's okay, because I, I really want interaction. I, I don't wanna speak for two hours, so it's okay. The clinician would have to tell you he wanted three, three millimeters, the difference would be clinically meaningful. Right. But the clinician would have to tell you the, the size of the standard deviation who is going to tell you the size of the standard deviation? She said, absolutely. It is very hard. It is very hard. And that's why I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you how to kind of go around it. I'm going to show you that. And, and there are two. It is very hard. I mean, you know, physicians don't think standard deviation. I mean, they just don't. But a statistician can help. For example, I mean, a statistician can come and say, well, okay, I understand you can't give me the standard deviation, 15, uh, but let's talk about it. What do you think the difference could be? Oh, I think it would be between, you know, such and such. Oh, okay. Do you think these are really far apart? Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, if you think it's between this and this, let's think for a minute that this is four standard deviations. Where, where do you come with four? Well, you know, again, very rough, very, very rough. You know, sample size is a lot of, and that's why we do sample size recalculation. But if we have time, we'll talk about that. But the, the, to answer your question is, number one, it is extremely hard. But you can talk with your investigator and say, okay, you think it goes between this and this. Do you think like maybe the vast majority, like 90 or 95% of the people could see a difference? Well, I don't know, but maybe, okay. So if this is the range, do you think I, maybe I can call this forced and deviation? Where the forced and deviation comes from? Minus two and plus two covers 95% of the people. So, my, my point is, is not to be particularly about this example. My point is the statistician can walk you, we can walk with you to try together to get a rough number for the standard deviation. But I would be amazed 
if the physician came and says, oh yeah, I know exactly what the standard deviation is, 15.3. I mean, that is just not gonna happen. It's just not gonna happen. So, and that's expected, that's really expected. So you, you, you raise a very good point, and that's just the way, it, sample size calculation is, an, is, is at least half art, half science. And what, well, one third art, one third science, and it's mostly practical stuff. Cost, you know, I only have two million dollars or one million dollars for the site. Can you do something about it? 1,000 is just not going to work. Oh, sure, okay, let's work on it. <laughs> let's, but, you know, again, it's an art because you know, at some point, at some point, the trial doesn't have enough power and it's a waste of even the two million. You, you know what I'm saying? So, so, yes, it's an art, it's a science, it's practical stuff, and, and you try to work with all these things, but at some point, you know, if your power is 40% because you don't have money to do more, then it's time to say, you know, maybe we shouldn't do this trial. Well, may, not maybe, but we shouldn't do this trial because again, even if you spend two million on an underpower, it's, it could be completely wasted money. And that's, I call it unethical. It's not just waste money, it's unethical. Because remember, we're talking about people coming into the clinical trial, not just money. So, uh, bottom line, it's an art. Yes, please. All the small samples are low power? Say that again, please. All the small samples are lower power? All the small samples are low power? No. No, it's, uh, it's, it's a, what, it, what is small, what is large. But that's exactly what we're going to talk about. Small, sam small sample size is, is, is small, in other words, not enough power, depending on all the other pieces, you know? So you say, if I have a sample size of 20, do I have enough power? Well, what is the standard deviation? Where is the alpha? What is the beta? Okay, this is your power, for example. And you find out that it's 80%. Maybe, you know, so the, the point is, it's the combination of all these, and we're gonna go one by one, it's the combination of all these items that m tells you, wh tell you whether it is low power or not, or whether the sample size is enough or not. It's the combination. So that's, that's what I, I'm gonna go through, is uh, what the biostatistician needs and why. Okay, so we're gonna start with the number of treatment groups. That's pretty uh, straightforward. Uh, let me catch up with my uh, notes. Not that they're important, but sometimes I, I forget to say something. Okay, so uh, number of treatment groups. Yeah, Desculpa. Yeah, please. Neste exemplo, nós não temos como saber, é, por exemplo, em que fase da pesquisa que se enquadra. Né? E a gente sabe que há diferenças no número limite de, de participantes. Por exemplo, no fase 1, você pode ter entre 10 a 30 participantes. No fase 2, você pode aumentar um pouco mais, 3, um pouco mais. E aqui a gente chega a um quantitativo de 1.052. Se fosse um fase 1, por exemplo, não seria um número é, compatível com a fase do estudo. Aonde que nessa fórmula a gente pode fazer uma consideração de acordo com a fase do seu, do seu trial? Uh, very, very good question. Um, actually, you, you saw the slides that I went a little bit fast. This is early phase. <laughs> And, and Laura Lee told me, make sure you talk about early phase. And I put the slides, you know. So I'm, I'm Laura Lee, you were right. So um, I, I put the slides, and then this morning I said, well, maybe I won't have time. I'm going to skip those. And then you're asking. Uh, I can go and show you the slides. I can do that. Uh, but I want to answer you first your question. Uh, you, if I understood correctly, you're saying you have a formula, it gives you the sample size. Where in the formula does it 
say anything about which stage because of, of course 1052 whatever the number was you're not going to do a, an early phase trial with 1052 uh, that for sure okay so so the answer is well does the formula change no the formula does not change what the formula says it says but all the other components change for example Remember, uh, an early phase is to get a sense. A later phase is more definitive, right? So when you want to be more definitive, you want things to be tight. So high power, low type 1 error, alpha. So you want everything to be nice and tight because at the end of the day, you're going to say, oh, yeah, this thing works or, you know. Okay. So, so in early phase you would say, well, you know, I don't need a 90% power. I can go with 60. You know, if, you know, or, or you can say, you know, I want to see a big treatment effect. So, the, the, it, it's not that the formula has changed, it's more that the parameters have changed. Now, having said that, so you do your early phase trials and you get it's not significant. Honestly, I wouldn't just rely on the p-value. P-value is 0.15, let's say. So you do, you know, the, 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 the formula tells you 1,000. You say, well, this is early phase. I'm not going to do that. What power am I going to get if I did 50 instead of 1,000? So statistician calculates, you're going to get power of 60% uh, or 50%. Fine. Let's do that. Again, you know, what I was saying earlier about ethics, and remember I was saying it's unethical to do a low power, I was talking, and I should have made that clear, I was talking about the definitive study. But if the goal is to get a sense, it's still going to move science. And that's still worthwhile. And, and I'm, you know, I'm glad we were clarifying this. Uh, so, but another point I want to make is that Okay, so you did your 50 instead of 1,000, and of course it's, it's not that, it's not going to be like this, but let's say you do the 50 instead of the 1,000, and you get a p-value of 0.15, okay? So, okay, so it's not significant, it doesn't tell me anything, okay, so did I waste money, did I waste time? No. Always, always, always look at the confidence interval. Look at the point estimate, you remember the point estimate? the difference and the confidence interval around it. Why? Because that's going to tell you where you are. So if the difference is in the right direction, meaning the new treatment is better than the control, you say, okay, well, you know, I started with 50 and I, I knew I had low power, but I'm looking at my estimate and it looks pretty good. The, the difference is pretty big, but because, because of low sample size, and because, you know, I, I, because of low sample size and, and low power, my confidence interval is so wide, it covers zero. And because it covers zero, I'm not getting uh, uh, a significant result. So th my bottom line point is, look at the confidence interval. And you say, well, you know, it looks like I saw a difference, but it was more sort of a, uh, a technical thing. Now, that it wasn't significant. Now you're going to say, well, you know, but you're saying this is unethical. Again, uh, if you are in an early phase, you are moving science by saying, you know, it looks like, and maybe I'm going to do a trial the next. If, if I saw really close to zero, a difference close to zero, or sometimes it goes in the wrong direction, you would say, okay, I, it doesn't look like this is going to work. But, but you know my point? My point is it's... Uh, it's which phase you're in, what is the question? The question is, is it a definitive? If it's a definitive, you've got to be doing it right. If it is exploratory, the whole trial is kind of to understand a little bit better, then you, you lower your restrictions. I answer your question? Yeah, okay. Thank you, a very good question. Okay, so, you know, it, it says the number of treatment groups, what this bullet point is, the number of treatment groups makes a difference in your sample size. Well, yeah, it does, because, you know, remember, we said you multiply 
the, the n, which is per treatment group, you multiply by two because you have two treatment groups and gives you the sample size. So yes, the number of treatment groups affects the, the sample size. That's bullet number one. Is it a superiority or a non-inferiority trial? Or an equivalence trial? And we heard a little bit about that yesterday. So you're going to say, well, where, where in the formula does it make a difference? Well, it makes a difference in the alpha and the beta. This is, is for a superiority trial. So the alpha is divided by two. It's a two-sided. The alpha is divided by two, and, the, and the, the beta is by itself. That's a superiority. And the delta is the difference to detect. And so when you do all the formula, you get the 1,052. That's for superiority. So how is it different when you do non-inferiority? Well, when you do non-inferiority, it's no longer alpha divided by two, it's alpha, because you're looking at one side, okay? And then the beta, and the delta is no longer the difference, it's the non-inferiority limit. In other words, and I, I, it's, it's how far apart can they be and you still call it the same? You know, and it doesn't have to be the same three. I just put three as a number. Uh, actually, I, I, w I shouldn't have put three because this is confusing. This three is not the same as the other three. They're actually different things. Okay, but this in non-inferiority limit, basically what it is all about is how, how different can they be and I still call it, uh, it's the same thing. That's what this non-inferiority limit is all about. And then you plug in the formula with the right alpha and the right beta, and you get a different sample size. And in equivalence, which is same concept, non-inferiority is one sort of one-sided. Equivalence is now you have to be within the plus or minus three, and you can see that the, the alpha over two became alpha, and the beta became beta over two. Again, of course you don't have to remember. This is not going to be on the exam, uh, but but but. I'm just showing you where these things are showing up in the formula. That's all I'm trying to do. So, and if you do uh, an equivalence, and you, again, this three it may not be the same as the first three. It's not, it may not, it's probably not gonna be the same as the second three. But, but if you had the equivalence limit, this would be the sample size, okay? Am I going at a good speed? Are you following me? Yeah, okay. A statistician wants to know whether it's one-sided or two-sided. Okay, so you're gonna say, well, where, where does it make a difference? Okay, well, th this was the formula for a, in the formula I showed you, and we divided by two. So if you keep the alpha the same, Remember, uh, uh, Laura Lee yesterday said that, you know, you may want to, if, if you're going to do one-sided, you may actually have the alpha as 0 0.025. But just for, just for illustration, if you were to keep the alpha 5% for both, if you were to do two-sided or one-sided, the difference is in the, in the formula is where the alpha is. The two-sided is you divide by two, and the one-sided you leave it as alpha. Expected dropout rate, you know, like I was, I think I alluded to yesterday, the expected dropout rate, we have a lot of dropout in our trials because we deal with drug abusers. And uh, so we have to account for that. Uh, you know, if we have too many, that's a, a bigger problem than sample size problems because then you get into biases. But, but we have to account. We have to say, well, the sample size is 1,000 assuming everybody's going to come and finish everything. But that's, we know that's not going to happen. We know from our trials that we get, you know, maybe 20% dropout rate. So we have to adjust for that what we think is going to happen. And basically, you can imagine, I mean, I think that's pretty logical, that if the expected dropout rate goes up, the sample size is going to go up because you need to inflate the sample size by that much. <coughs> And if the expected dropout rate goes down, the, the sample size goes down. 
You want a question? I'm sorry, but I, no, I'm just trying don't apologize. to to meet yes. with less uh, the information from yesterday. Yes, please. Uh, because someone told us yesterday that in an intention to treat analysis, yes. uh, everybody who comes in is going to be analyzed on the trial, yes. even they if they drop out. If you are increasing your sample size, expecting those dropouts, does it mean that you are not going to analyze by intention okay. to treat? Okay. Uh, you just have to do it when you are not going to analyze by intention to treat, okay. or even if you increase, why are you increasing your sample size? Very good question. If you are going to analyze everybody, this is the question. Very good question, very practical and good question. You know, you have dropout. Okay, we had our trial where you measure at before randomization and at week 12. Okay, that's your primary outcome. Okay, so the person dropped out before week 12. The statistician, you've got to do intent to treat analysis. And you say, but I don't have an outcome for this person. The person is gone. <laughs> You can't analyze a data point that you don't have. You, you, you know what I'm saying? So if the person dropped out, you just don't have the value. Yeah, you don't know what happened. Now, but having said that, uh, we would tell you, statisticians, and you know, not just statisticians, people uh, would, would say, you know what, even if they dropped out, try to get the measure at week 12. Try. So even if they stop coming to the clinic, maybe they were supposed to come every week to get their pill, uh, even if they disappeared and you have this important measure, try to find the participant and get that measure. If you do, you are supposed to include them in the analysis, in the arm that they were assigned, even if they stop taking the medication. That's really intent to treat. In other words, do everything you can to get that outcome, and if you do get it, it needs to be in. Now, if you don't get it, you can't do magic, right? It's not gonna go in. So what's the connection with all this? Well, that's when we say, well, if it's, the person is gone and we don't have anything, we better increase the sample size so that they're going to be excluded, right? We don't want to exclude them, but if we don't have their measure, they're going to be excluded from the primary analysis, right? Yeah, we don't have the measure. They're not going to be included in the primary, uh, primary analysis, in the primary model, if we don't have a point for them. So, they're going to be excluded. We can't do anything else. And if they're going to be excluded, then we want to make sure the sample size is big enough to do the analysis on those that, you know, are still there. Maybe we can talk. I don't think you... Okay. Does it? Does it make sense? Okay. All right. So, again, the point is increase the sample size to account for the expected amount of missing data in the primary analysis. Oh, yeah. So now there is a sign kind of, and this is uh, from the book, it's attributed to Lakin. It's, uh, it's a rule of thumb. I don't think it has a you know, theoretical proof or anything, but it's a rule of thumb where the, uh, this is the calculated N. Okay, this is, this is from the formula. This is from the formula. And this is a factor, a factor that you have to inflate the sample size by. Okay? And, and you can see that if, if the dropout rate is anything but zero, it's, uh, it's going to be greater than one. If, if the dropout rate is anything greater than zero, it's going to it's going to be that, that factor is greater than 1, and the final sample size, the N sub F for final, the C is for calculated from the formula, 
the final is going to be the calculated multiplied by something greater than one. Okay, it's a, it's a rule of thumb for, for to use. And just to give you an example, you know, just to get a sense of what it does, you know, if, if you know, like I said, if the dropout rate is 0%, you, the final, that factor is equal to 1, and you're not doing anything. If it's 10%, that factor is 1.23, you're inflating the sample size, and it becomes 1,294, and etc. Obviously, the bigger the dropout rate, the more the inflation, and the higher the final sample size. Uh, logical stuff, yeah? Okay. So that was for the expected dropout rate. And now we're going to talk about the smallest uh, clinically meaningful difference to detect. And, and this is also very hard. I mean, you were talking about variance. That is very difficult. Standard deviation is very difficult, certainly very difficult. But even the clinically meaningful difference is hard for a clinician. So we know how... how you know, what would really make a difference? What would make you change practice? And a lot of investigators have a hard time giving you a number. And we're gonna talk about, well, they, maybe they don't have to give you one number. They don't have to give the statistician one number. Maybe they can give us two or three numbers or a range, and, and then we'll, we'll try to see how things work out. And that's, that's in my presentation of sample size and power. I'll show you that. Now, where in the formula does it come from? It comes from that delta square. That's where in the formula is that minimum clinically meaningful uh, difference. Now, you got, again, concept. If, if the difference you want to detect is large, the sample size goes down. Does it make sense to you? You know, if you say, oh, I, I need at least this much, you know, I, I'd be happy to detect a difference of 10. If 10 is good, is good enough, then the sample size goes down. Or you may say, well, no, I, I, I want to be able to detect a difference of 3. Well, I mean, think about it. That finding a 3 is harder than finding 10, right? I mean, just generally speaking, right? Well, harder translates into higher uh, sample size. Okay, so finding 10 is easier than finding 3, and therefore, if you want to detect 10, you know, sample size goes down. So, bottom line is, if the difference goes up, sample size goes down. If the difference to detect goes down, uh, sample size goes up. And, you know, if, if, you know I mean, if you plug in those formula in the, if, if you plug in those numbers, if, if the difference to detect went from 3 to 4, the sample size would go from 1,052 to 592. If, if the, 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 the delta, the difference to detect, went from 3 to 2, now you're going down, the sample size would go from 1,052 to 2,366. So it's important stuff, you know? And again, I don't know, does this, do you understand what this is? Okay. It's all a matter of this. You, know, you say, I don't have money to enroll 2,366. Statistician, do something. Okay. Okay. It depends on alpha. Alpha, also known as, aka also known as, chance of type 1 error. For example, we use 5%. Nothing magic about 5%, by the way, but that's, it's, it's magic because it's used so much, but there's really nothing magic about it. So I want to kind of review very quickly. Uh, we heard about uh, alpha and the type 1 error. Uh, this is where it comes from, by the way, from the formula. And, and just, like I said, review what, what it's all about. In a non-technical definition, in superiority trial, uh, Alpha is the chance of concluding that the experimental treatment is more effective than the control when in fact it is not. Okay? If it, it is not, type 1 error is saying that there is a difference when in fact there is it. The technical definition, and that's where it gets yucky, 
is the probability of rejecting H0, the null hypothesis, when H0 is true. Fine. But what I want to talk about, which I think is interesting, and, and, and Laura Lee talked yesterday about, you know, which one is more important, alpha or beta? It depends on the perspective. So let's take a, a regulatory agency, the, in, our, in the US it will be the FDA. Uh, the FDA type one error is extremely important because it does not want to approve a, uh, a medication that is not effective, efficacious. It does not want to do that. This is very important for the FDA. Are you following me? It does not want to do that. So FDA comes and says, 0.05. Everybody uses, I mean, it, it doesn't, it depends. But the FDA is imposing the type 1 error on the pharmaceutical company and everybody else. Anything that has to go through the FDA. Because it's very important for the FDA to control that. Okay? The pharmaceutical says, hey, you know, if I approve a drug that's not efficacious, I don't care. I'm going to make money. Well, I'm exaggerating. I mean, pharmaceutical companies, I, I hope, don't think that way. I'm, so I'm exaggerating. But, but you, you, you understand the, the, my point. The, the point is the pharmaceutical company, that's fine, okay. If I, if, if I find something significant when in true it is not, I'm not going to cry over it, okay? So it, it really depends on the, the perspective. Bottom line, most common used uh, value of alpha is, is uh, in a two-sided, is 0.05. I have to check my time. Yeah, I, I know, but I, uh, okay. So, alpha goes up, sample size goes down. What's the logic? If you allow yourself to make, to have, make, more likely to make an error, right? You are loosening things up, your sample size is gonna go down. If, you know, you, you know what I'm saying? If, if, if you say, oh, it's okay if I make an error, well, okay, well, you might as well lower the sample size. But if you wanna make sure that you don't make an error, your sample size goes up. So as the chance of making an error goes up, sample size goes down. As the chance of going, making an error goes down, sample size goes up. Does that make sense? So in terms of numbers, if you took alpha from 0.05 to 0.1, the sample size would, would drop to 858. This is just to give you a sense of what happens to the numbers. I mean, Okay, so it's, that's all the point of these slides. And, it, oops. and if, it, if it went from 0.05 to 0.025, the sample size would go up from 1,052 to 1,242. Then there is power. It's the power to detect an effect. Where does it come in the formula? This is where it is in the formula. That's where it, sh it shows up. Okay? So, again, I want to do the same thing that I did for alpha. What's the non-technical definition for superiority trial? It's the chance of concluding that the experimental treatment is more effective when in fact it is. So if you have a medication that is actually unknown to you, but it's actually effective, you want to be able to detect that. You want to be able to find out that. You want to be able to conclude that correctly. That's power. The technical definition is the probability of rejecting H0. Remember, H0 is the null, so that there is no difference. You're rejecting it, finding that there is a difference when H0 is false, when there is actually a true difference. And it's the same thing, you know? It, it's the same kind of perspective. The FDA says, well, the regulatory agency says, you know, 
if a pharmaceutical company has an effective drug and they found out that it's not effective, you know, I'm not going to worry about it. And again, I'm exaggerating because the FDA wants to approve medications that do work. I mean, it's public health. So, so they do, I mean, they do have, but, you know, to push a little bit, uh, they say, well, you know, the pharmaceutical company is going to worry about that. Going to the pharmaceutical company, could you imagine if a pharmaceutical company has a medication that is actually truly effective and it finds out that it's not? It will be terrible because, you know, it's so hard to find something that's effective. So if they found it and they do a sample size and they, because of their sample size, they found that it's not the conclusion is, you know, they didn't find a significant result, it will be really something they don't want to get into this error. Okay, so the point here is that the pharmaceutical company is very interested in keeping the power high. That's really the point. And this goes back to the question that was asked about the early phase and, uh, and later phase. And I also want to give uh, credit to Laura Lee for suggesting to include that. Uh, so for early phase, uh, you know, you may want to consider a power between 0.6 and 0.8 for an early phase, but for a definitive, a later phase, uh, you may want to consider, I mean, you typically you consider something that's in the range of 0.8 to 0.95. And it's basically the same logic. If you want to increase power, you increase the sample size. If you want to make sure you find something, well, you better increase your sample size to find it. If power goes down, sample size goes down. And just to show you a little bit what happens to the numbers, you know, if the power goes from 90% to 95, the sample size goes from 1,052 to 1,300. And if the power goes down from 90 to 80, you see how the sample size also goes down. Are we okay so far? Have you fallen asleep? Too much stat stuff, right? Okay, Re okay. Something about recalculate sample size. Can we have a microphone? That's okay. Can we have a microphone? I, I saw something about recalculate sample size, but I, I couldn't read the stuff. He was nice enough. He wrote it in English for me, but that's okay. <laughs> I, would, I would like to know if it is possible or is straight to rec uh, recalculate the uh, sample size during the, the surge. If you found a oh, dropout... You're, you're talking in English? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand what they're saying. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I would like to know is, if it's possible to re, or, or straight to recalculate the sample size during the, the search if you found a dropout uh, bigger than you, are, you, you predicted in the project search, in the, the early phase, or is not uh, correct. Okay. So you're talking about recalculate the sample yeah. size once the trial has started to see if you're okay kind of thing. Yeah. That's exactly that's that section that I had. But I want to answer your question because since you're asking it. Uh, there, are, um, there are two kinds of sample size recalculation. There are two kinds of sample size recalculation. And it's okay. It's done. It, okay. <laughs> I'm trying to get it logically here. There are two kinds of sample size recalculation. There is one kind where you don't look at the treatment effect that you are looking at, that you have so far. This is very important. So there is the kind where you look at the nuisance parameters. We call them nuisance parameters. Nuisance parameters are things like variance, correlation, uh, 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 not the clinically difference, not the minimum, okay. So you look at these things and you say, well, I had no idea. When I started the trial, I had no idea what the variability is, you know. So I said, okay, 15. 
Now, when you start the trial, you can actually, we do it by default in our trials. I think you should, if you can, recalculate the sample size based on the variance you're seeing so far. Not the treatment effect, and this is, this is very important. Not that the treatment effect you see so far, just the variance. And there are ways to calculate the variance without looking at the treatment effect. So you calculate the variance on, based on real data so far. You calculate correlations on repeated measure so far. And you say, oh, wow, this is not what I thought at the beginning of the trial. So I, now I'm going to put the new values and recalculate the sample size. That is not only OK. It, I say it's encouraged. Now, if you're going to look at the treatment effect and you say, well, I thought 3 was OK, but I'm looking and it's really 2.5. I thought that the minimum clinically difference is 3, but now I see 2.5. I'm going to plug 2.5 instead of 3 in my formula. That is very debatable because of potential. I would say, well, you thought the minimum clinically meaningful difference is 3, what, you change your mind now? It had nothing to do with the trial. Why did you change your mind? Others would say, this is a, a long debate, but my point is the first type, I think, should be done. The second type, so-so. In the dropout case, let's suppose you ch uh, choose a... Yes, yes. And, and exactly, the drop-up drop too. The drop-up too. These are all, we call them nuisance parameters. In other words, things that are not key to the trial, well, they're not key in the sense they're not of particular interest, but we made assumptions about them, and, and we find out that the so, so drop, dropout rate is one of them too. Yes. Very, thank you. And, and it, it is a section I was going to talk about, but anyways. Okay. Any other? Yeah, yeah, please. Yes, uh, regarding the dropout rate, yeah. uh, what if you have a dropout, uh, a larger dropout in one of the arms and not the other ones? How do you recalculate only for, one, for the arm that has a higher dropout? Uh, yeah. Is there a rule for that? Yeah. Or do you have to add to all of the arms? You're not going to like what I'm going to tell you. If you have a differential dropout rate, meaning a dropout rate in one arm is different from a dropout rate, you kind of have a serious problem in your hands. And I, I, I'm, I'm sorry, but because then you start to think, why? Remember confounding? And I, I was so happy the speaker yesterday talked about confounding, confounding. Yes, yes. That's ex why, are, why is there more dropout in one arm? It's got to be related to the treatment, right? Remember randomization, everything is equal except treatment, and now I'm... Well, even if it's blinding, I mean, even if it's blinded. So I take the pill, I don't know whether I have placebo or not, and I vomit like crazy, and I drop out. So even if I was blinded, all the ones in the medication are going to drop out. The one in placebo are just fine, because they're taking a sugar pill. But the, the point is, it's serious. As soon as things are different for the two treatment arms, it's getting serious. Because I would say, I would say obviously, but obviously is not a good word. I would say, you know, chances are there is something about the treatment. And now we are confounding. Dropout and treatment are confounded. So if I exclude all the dropout, I exclude 20% in one arm because that's the dropout, and 40% in the other arm because that's the dropout, and I don't have any measures for them. So, so before I worry about sample size, I have a bigger problem. And I, I'm sorry, but I don't have a, 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 a feel-good answer. Any other questions? Okay, so then we go to variability of the primary outcome measure. And again, I want to emphasize, it is very hard, very, very hard for, for anybody, not just the investigator, for a statistician, I mean, to say. But like I was saying, you can kind of discuss it and get a sense and at least come to something that could be possible. 
And if you do ca uh, sample size recalculation, you just adjust it. With a sample size recalculation, we have in our, in our clinical trials network, by default, we say, we're going to recalculate the sample size. Then the question becomes when. It's a rule of thumb. We say, well, halfway. Why halfway? Well, because halfway you have enough, and halfway it's not too late. <laughs> it's really that simple. But the problem is sometimes even halfway is too late because I think I, I, I said it the other day, if by, by the time you, you, know, you freeze the data, you analyze, you take it to your data and safety monitoring board, they uh, debate, they make a decision, and then the uh, NIH Institute decides by the time all this is done, it could be, I'm not saying it is, it could be that enrollment was so fast that the enrollment is over. So we do calculate that. We say, what do we think? How fast do we think the trial is going to go? How fast? So we don't know, but how fast is it going to go? How, how long is the uh, treatment out? The primary outcome is, you know, it could be fast, but the treatment, the primary outcome is a year later. Now remember, we're not going to calculate the difference, but we're going to calculate its variance. So we do need it. So it's not just enough to be enrolled. You have also to have the primary outcome for those enrolled. And if the primary outcome is in the first week, you're fine. But if, let's say, it's in six months. So the point is, if it's fast enough, and then you have to wait six months, and then you have to freeze, blah, 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 by the time all this is done, the trial is over, then we, we, we try to get a sense of it up front, and if it looks like it's not going to be done, we drop it. We say we're not going to do it. Okay. So where does the variance come in? That's where it comes in, the formula. I mean, that's really that simple. And it goes back to this graph. Variability is very important. So if variability goes up, that's a bad thing. Sample size goes up. Because the sample size, the, the, what you, you, you remember yesterday, we were talking about uh, variance, uh, standard deviation, and standard error. Standard error is the standard deviation divided by square root of n. So when the sample size goes up, the standard error goes down. Variability of the mean goes down. And if it goes down, sample size goes down. And again, just to give you an idea about what happens to those numbers, if you took a standard deviation from 15 to 20, the sample size would go to 1868. If you take it from 15 to 10, the sample size would drop to 468. Then there is, and this is a, a way, a kind of a shortcut. Uh, I don't particularly like it, but it's done. So we say, well, I'm not sure about the clinically meaningful difference, and I'm certainly not sure about the variability. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to combine the two. How do you combine the two? You take the difference divided by the standard deviation. It actually solves two problems in one. Yeah, it's OK. I mean, as you know, it's the inverse, but, you know, and the f you, uh, algebraically, you fix it. So it's okay. But the pr the, instead of having, you know, you can divide by delta squared divided by sigma squared. So, so instead of worrying about delta and worrying about sigma, I'm going to combine them into one ratio and say it's the standardized treatment effect. And then the general thinking is that a small standardized treatment effect is around 0.2, a medium is 0.5, a large is 0.8. See what I did now? I, I, well, I didn't do it. Uh, actually, I don't know if this was his intent, but that's another story. But people are using that, and, and they're saying, instead of worrying about delta and sigma, I'm gonna, now I have a generic, a generic uh, kind of uh, treatment effect divided by standard deviation. And I can say for any trial, I would like to detect a difference of 0.5, a standard, uh, standardized treatment effect of 0.5. And now, 
I don't have to say what the clinically meaningful difference is. I don't have to say what the variance is. I'm just telling you it's 0.5. And then in the formula, it, it, it works. Because the formula, instead of worrying about each one separately, you take the ratio and it took care of it. Now, and it's okay. I mean, it's, it's not a, a huge problem. But what I don't like about it is that the context and the clinical context is gone. In other words, whatever trial you're talking about, it doesn't matter what you're measuring, it doesn't matter what you're studying, I can say I would like to, be, to detect a, uh, a standardized effect size of 0.35. Okay, what does it mean? What's 0.35? What does it mean in clinical terms? We don't know. We don't know what it means. So that's the part you kind of um, uh, threw away the clinical context. And I, I don't particularly like that. And I'm not sure the person who invented this, it's called Cohen's D, I'm not sure if this was his intent. I think actually it was not, but that's another story. Okay, so for dichotomous binary outcome or comparing proportions, so instead of talking about the detecting a delta and a variability, we're talking about expected, oh yeah, we're talking about expected proportion in, in both groups. We have a question. It's not a question, it's an observation. In the last slide, yeah. isn't it the opposite? Uh, the omega is in the other side, and D is equal to, because in the formula is the opposite. Uh, the, Sigma. The, the point is that I wish I had a board to write it down but the, the point is that you know you, the, the point of this red circle is that you're combining instead of worrying about this and this no you're I, combining got it. It to, I got yeah, it I got it but in the second slide the Sigma is I know, is I know. but oh, okay yeah, Giselle had the same question, I right? just... Yeah, but, but think about putting the sigma squared under the delta in the denominator. So you're back to delta over sigma squared. So it's an algebraic thing. It's really, I mean, it's okay. But that is the correct definition. We, we can talk, I mean. It's, a, it's a really an algebraic thing. So, okay, that's for dichotomous. And then there is the, the last one, is the correlation between measurements within the same cluster. We talked about cluster randomization yesterday, and, you know, when you have clusters, you know, now you have the participants are in the same cluster, and there is some correlation between the measurements within a cluster because they are in the same hospital, in the same school, there are things that are the same as compared to another hospital, another school. And because of that, there is a correlation between observations within a cluster. You are going to talk about binary uh, oh, outcomes. And Thank you. Okay, I... I uh, so, so... Yeah, so if for the binary, we're talking about proportions, right? Because if it's a yes, no, you can say how many had yeses here, how many had yeses, no, what are the proportions? So, so you, you don't have really a delta, I mean, you have a difference of proportions, but instead of, you know, and the variability, uh, you may know that, uh, you know, variance in a, in, a, in a binomial is really the proportion, is a function of sample size and proportions. So instead of worrying about delta and sigma squared, you need to worry about the proportion you expect, let's say, in the control. You, know, you can do it two ways. The proportion you expect in the controls and the proportion you expect in the uh, new medication. And that will take care of both the delta and the sigma squared because if you have proportions, you have variance. Or you can say, I expect this proportion in the control and I want to see a difference of 10%, which is really the same of saying the new medication would be this plus 10. So the whole point of the slide is in the case of binary, 
instead of delta and sigma squared, it's really the proportion in each arm that you need to specify to get sample size. That's really the point of the slide. Okay, so we were talking about correlation between uh, observation within a cluster because they come from the same hospital or school. They're correlated. They're, they're coming from the same place. And I thought I was just going to show you graphically. I got it from Wikipedia, uh, you know, just to get a sense of what does it mean? What's ICC? What you see is those, uh, the vertical lines are, is a cluster. So you've got cluster number one, number two, number three. These are clusters, they're hospitals. Okay, and, and the, the y-axis, the vertical axis, are the data values, okay? So, in, in hospital one, they are the, you can see that as you go from hospital to hospital, the measurements tend to be together. They are bunched together. That means the ICC is, is high. So when the ICC is high, all it means is that the measurements from a given hospital tends to bunch together compared to other hospitals. So, okay, so you're gonna say, well, what's a, what's a low ICC, uh, interclass correlation? Uh, you can see here that, you know, the measurements within a cluster are all over the place. And you can't, you can't see that they're bunched together within a hospital. So that's a, a, a small interclass correlation. It is just to give you a, a graphical sense of what is uh, interclass correlation. So when interclass correlation goes up, sample size goes up. And when interclass correlation goes down, sample size goes down. By the way, I, I forgot to mention, and it's in the slide here, uh, when you take repeated measures, you know what repeated measure is? So you, for the same participant, you take the primary outcome at week 6, 12, whatever, 24. These are repeated measure measures. This is the same as cluster, because now the individual is a cluster, and you are taking measurements within a person, within the participant, and they are correlated. So it's the same concept. So whether it is a cluster randomization where you have hospitals or whether it is repeated measure, it's the same concept. So if intra-class correlation goes up or if the correlation between repeated measure goes up, the sample size goes up and if the ICC goes down, the sample size goes down. And you, know, you, may, you may think, well, wait a second, I thought high correlation is a good thing, right? High correlation is usually in statistics is a good thing. And here, it looks like, you know, when I have a good thing, I have to pay more. Why is that? So, it's a little bit counterintuitive until you think about it a little bit more. What it is really is that it's about information. If the correlation between, within a cluster is very high, each observation has less inform new information. Because it's highly correlated, each additional measurement has less information. Because you could have predicted it from the previous one. But if they have a low correlation, each new observation within a cluster is much more informative. And that's good. So, each time you get one more, that's, you're getting a lot for this one more with a low correlation. Okay? Well, think about it if you, it's hard to understand. And then there is also a, a, a formula that basically how to adjust for the correlation. And this is a formula. You can see the M is the number of clusters. So assuming you have decided how many clusters, the ICC is the intra-class correlation. The NC is the calculated. So this is the calculated sample size. This is from the formula, okay? And, um, and then this big factor is greater than one as soon as the ICC is greater than zero. If it is zero, then it's the same. And NF is the final. 
Okay? Another one that is extremely hard to know. So the statistician says, uh, Dr. So-and-so, what is the intra-class correlation? So I can plug it in my formula. I don't even know what you're talking about. So very, very hard, very, very. And that's one that can go into the sample size recalculation because this is a nuisance parameter. You look at it, you actually, once the trial starts and you're halfway, you actually calculate it. You can from the data you have so far. And you say, oh my, I thought it was going to be 0 .2, 0 0.02 or 0 0.2, it doesn't matter, and it's much higher. So I need a bigger sample size. You say, okay, let's increase the sample size. You go to FIO Cruz and you say, I need more money because I've increased the sample size or NIH. And this gives you an idea about what happens to the numbers when the ICC moves. You know, if it's zero, it's the same because the factor is one. If it starts to creep up, you can see it goes up very fast. Remember, the higher the correlation, the less information per observation. That's basically the bottom line. So you need more. So, Oh, one, one point about ICC is you say, okay, you know, I'm doing a cluster uh, uh, randomized trial. I get all the pieces. This is, you know, two-sided, significance level, power, blah, 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 number of clusters, ICC, total sample size. Okay? I do exactly the way I'm supposed to do with the ICC formula, and I get a sample size of 2,051. So that's... the. the what the sample size that you should use. Now let's say that somebody else have no idea about ICC, didn't take the, this course and doesn't know about ICC and doesn't know it's supposed to inflate the sample size. And they ignore the ICC. They, they, they do the formula without this, I don't know what ICC is. I'm gonna do it the way, the regular way. What happens? Well, in this particular example, if you ignore the ICC, you, it's basically the same as saying it's zero. It's exactly the same. If you ignore it, you're saying it's zero. If it's zero, this is the sample size. It's the same 1,052 from the formula. But what happened? Your true power now is not 90 the way you think. It's now it's 64.2. And you don't know it. Is that, did I make this point clear? Okay. Okay, so this is, this is a long block of stuff. Uh, so this, this is the list. This is the list of, that we went through, and I would just wanna kind of highlight a little bit. The, the, the white stuff is relatively easy to decide. You know, how many treatment groups? Well, that's, you know, uh, uh, superiority. I mean, the, the, the white, bullet points are, you know, it's something easy. The green bullet points are harder. You know, what do you think the dropout rate is? What is the clinically meaningful difference? That's a little bit harder. And the yellow ones are very hard, very, very hard. But we need them. One more piece of information. Is there any interim analysis? I'm not going to go over this, but if you are doing an interim analysis, you need to know about the statistician needs to know about it because we need to adjust the alpha. And I'm, I'm going to interim analysis is actually uh, testing the treatment effect um, through through group sequential method, for example, to see if you could stop the trial early for efficacy or futility or or harm. And then. You know, you have the best statistician, you're the best investigator, you know, everything is done right, you give the sample size, and I say, nope, I don't have the money for that. So, cost and feasibility, or I can't wait five years because I'm not gonna be recruiting that fast. 2,000 is unrealistic, it's not gonna happen. I have a grant for three years, 2,000 is gonna take five years right there. That's it. And these trump <laughs> all the statistics you want to do. I mean, they override all the statistics you can think of. If you can't do it, you can't do it. So 
They are key factors in the final decision on sample size. I found out something I didn't know about PowerPoint is you can put a little sign in your slide and say, go to slide this. I didn't know that. So I jumped. I jumped the simulation. The simulation is when things get very complicated. The whole design is very, very complicated. Basically, uh, you, you, you can't use the formula anymore. Then you simulate data. In other words, you generate, based on assumptions, you generate data. So, for example, you say, well, what if I had a sample size of 500? You generate 500, you get the p-value, and you generate the 500 a second time, and you generate it a thousand times. Computers are fast. And then that's simulation, and you calculate the power and the sample size through simulation. That's about all I'm going to say. But the slides go through step by step. So if you can you know, learn it from the slides, that's great. But the, it is important because more and more uh, people, a statistician, use simulation to get sample size. So what I'm going to do, and I, th I think we'll be finished on time, but I really thought this is important. And I'm glad we talked about sample size recalculation because uh, uh, in, in, a, in a way we, we covered, in a quick way, we covered the last one. So presentation of power analysis. So, so, you know, we have the formula. Yeah, this is in the design stage of the trial, writing the protocol. You know, so how, 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 how is the communication between the investigator and the statistician going to work? Example to avoid. See the blue thing? Example to avoid. No, let's, don't do it this way. And what is this way? This way says, okay. I've got a superiority trial design, true treatment groups, two-sided hypothesis, alpha, delta, power, variance, expected dropout rate, number of clusters, intercluster. I've got all the, the investigator is a wonderful person. All the numbers you want, statistician, here they are. And the statistician enters everything in the formula, gets the final sample size 301. So my question is, what's wrong with that? OK. Your turn. What's wrong with this? Take a guess. I know it's a tricky question, but hey, I want to have some fun. What's wrong? What, why is it an example to avoid? Looks pretty, pretty good to me. Take a guess. You don't have to. Don't, you know, you don't have to be right, just... Okay, English? The number isn't even. You don't have half sample sizes in each arm. Oh, I see, I see what you're saying, yeah. <laughs> Good for you. I, mean, <laughs> I didn't think about this, but... <laughs> I love this. This is fantastic. Uh, <laughs> you're absolutely right. And what, what do you do <laughs> when the formula gives you 301? You do 302. I mean, I'm, I'm serious. But <laughs> I'm going to fix this slide. <laughs> oh, that, I, that's wonderful. <laughs> Come on, give, take a guess. Take a guess. What's wrong with this? How sure are these numbers? How, how sure can the investigator be about these numbers? I'm giving you a hint. How, how, how sure? You mean the ICC is 0.03? Do we have a... No? Okay, that's okay if you can't. Well, what if the ICC is 0.025? What happens? We don't know. What if the variance, the standard deviation, is 10.5 and not 11? What happens to the sample size? We don't know. Right? So what, what's, uh, you know, I'm not playing games here, but what's the point? The point is, you know, we have all these assumptions, a whole list of assumptions, and a number, 302. What if... You know, things are a little... What if the dropout rate is 25% and not 20? 
do I know that 302 goes to 400 or does it go to 305? I don't know. So it's, it's kind of a sensitivity analysis. It's like, what if those assumptions, remember they're assumptions. We don't know all these things. I mean, some of them we do, some of them we set them, but other things we just assume. But what if these assumptions were a little bit off? We don't know what happens to the sample size when they are a little bit off. So, don't do it that way. You know, if your statistician does that, tell him or her, you're lazy, show me something better. And if they say, what do you mean something better? That's what I'm gonna show you. So, you start by keeping a few parameters constant. So you say, okay, well, look, we know it's a superiority trial. That's pretty much fixed. We know it's two treatment groups. That's pretty much agreed. We know it's a two-sided, we know alpha. I mean, that's, let's call these fixed. Okay, but I'm not sure about the clinically meaningful difference. <coughs> you know, I could go 80% or 90% on the power. I could go either way, depend on, okay. The variance of the primary outcome, forget it, I have no idea, okay? Dropout rate, well, I'm looking at past trials, they're not really the same as this one, but from what we've seen, sometimes they're 15%, sometimes they're 20, 25, 30, it's in around that ballpark, okay? And the intraclassical correlation, I really don't know, but I've read papers where they found intraclass correlation on completely different trials, and they are in the ballpark of 0.02. Oh, I'm not showing you. <laughs> they are in the ballpark of 0 0.02, 0 0.05, 0 0.1, or 0.15. So this is, sorry, I, I did that. Uh, so this is kind of, you know, I, I'm, the investigator is giving the statistician some numbers. Uh, some numbers are known, are fixed, and others are kind of, hmm, I think, this is what they, they are. So, how do you present, how does the statistician or how you investigator ask the statistician to present the power and the sample size calculation to you? Okay, and that's really the purpose of this presentation. I mean, of this uh, section of the presentation is for you to tell the statistician, don't give me just one number. I wanna see some kind of a range. And this is one example, it's not, you know, the example. So what happens here? Look, look at the table, unfortunately I can't just turn, I'm gonna look at the slide I have in front of me. So the alpha is fixed, the power is fixed, the expected dropout rate is fixed, let's say. Okay, so what you see inside the table is the sample size. But what's varying here is, if you see treatment effect, 0 0.10, 0 0.13, and 0.15. So I'm not sure what the treatment effect that I really want to be able to detect. I'm going to make it three possible values. Standard deviation, I don't know, but let's, let's say it's 0.4 and 0.45. And what you see inside the table are different sample sizes. Now, you look at that table and you say, well, so I could go anywhere between 330 and 940. That's a huge range. Okay, let's talk. Let's talk. Um, you can't afford 940, okay. So maybe, you know, point, would you be willing? Do you think like uh, physicians would be impressed with a difference of 0.13 instead of 0.10? Yes, yes, no, no. I mean, I'm not saying the answers are pre-specified, but, but you discuss. And that's where the art comes in. So I'm, I'm, go I'm gonna show you other examples of basically the same idea. So here you fix the alpha, which is 0.05, you fix the expected dropout rate. What you see inside the table is the power, okay? So what's varying it? Here what's varying it, you've got two sections of the table. So you, you've got two sections of the table. You've got this part and you've got this part. And the difference between these is that 
Here, the Cohen's D, remember the, the, the delta over sigma? It's 0.4, and here it's 0.3. So it went down, power goes, goes down. If you look at, you know, okay. So, and even within this Cohen's D of 0.4, they're looking at different scenarios. The mean is this, the standard deviation is this, and the difference to detect is this. So, the sample size here changes. And what we see inside the table is the, uh, uh, the power. Y you don't have to, you know, understand this table completely. Uh, the, 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 the point of this table is that you are keeping some things fixed and you are varying other things. And the things that you vary can change from table to table. That's, that's, that's the point. I like those even better because now you're looking at a graph. So, so here the, the alpha is uh, 0.05, it's fixed. And the, uh, the standardized treatment effect is 0.42, that's the Cohen's D. Okay, this is the correlation the ICC, the correlation within clusters. Okay, and, and this is basically zero, this is 0.3, green is 0.5, and black is 0.7. So these, this curve corresponds to these values. And what you have in the axis is the sample size per arm and the power, and the dropout rate is fixed at 30. Again, the whole point of this is you are fixing a few things and you are varying other things. So here you say, okay, I want an 80% 80 80 power and I want to be able to, uh, you know, the effect is 0.42 and I think the intra-class correlation is 0.3. With 80% power, if the ICC was 0.3, I need a sample size of 100 and whatever, 140. The point of this graph is that basically, yeah, thank you. The point of this graph is basically you look at different scenarios. That's really the point of this graph. You're looking at different scenarios and you're not fixed to one thing. And this gives you a sense of, you know, if, if I move some of the assumptions, what happens? And, and basically all the, the graphs are are basically the, the same point I'm making. In, in this case, you have the, the standard deviation is fixed at 10. The color uh, lines are the different effect sizes. And you can say, what if I took a sample size of 30, you know, and I want to detect two? What would my power be? So these are the effect sizes. So See, the smaller effect size, the lower the power. So if I want to detect two and I want to fix 300, that's going to be my power. That's not good enough. So either, either I move this or I move this. So you can play with this. You say, if, I want, if it's important for me to get 80% power, you know, what is my sample size if I want to be able to detect a difference of four? Well, it's around 200. You know what I'm saying? So you're playing. I mean, there are a zillion possible things that you can look at with this. But you are kind of have a picture of if I move with my assumption, how is my power or my sample size, uh, how, how does it move? That's basically the, the point. And if you increase the standard deviation, you can see that the power goes down. All the, the only difference between these graphs is the standard deviation is going up. So we start with 10, and then 15, and then 20. And you see the power is, is going down. And that's it. Uh, sample size recalculation we kind of covered. Uh, we have, what, three minutes, maybe one question. And if you really have burning questions, we can pick up uh, after the break. Uh, any questions?
Okay. Have a nice break.